So it's my pleasure to introduce Reinhard Rona from uh, Glamorous Paris. <laughs> and he's going to give us a new quick glamorous talk on structure and aging of bones. Over to you. Thank you. Well, I've been trying to think of a glamorous introduction. We've been hearing about the origins of life and what holds the universe together. What about bones? Well, about a century ago, Calvin thought he had something when he thought that ether was actually a bone structure. And that would have been the dark matter of the 19th century that really provide, provides a nice introduction. But well, it turned out that what Calvin had it all wrong. And I thought of something simpler. And I will start my talk by talking about bone. Oh, where is it? Just check on the oh yes, home on the beach. Um, home on the beach, you can have it in every wrist with inspiration sources. Looks nice. You, uh, this obvious uh, generation mechanism is the waves, and you've got the foam here that persists for some time. It's actually a short lived foam, really, but sometimes it's a bit longer lived. The aging is slower, mostly when there are some algae around which tend to stabilize the interfaces look like this a bit less pleasant you have the same thing on rivers in places where there's a lot of agriculture you also have these microorganisms with act as surfactants and it can get even more impressive this is a beach near sydney as far as i i read on the internet where this uh, algae blooming has been so intense that you have mountains and mountains of foams that just won't age and stay there on the beach, which is obviously a nuisance. But <coughs> friends are not always a nuisance. They can also be useful. These nice pictures here are bottles, foams, uh, whose interfaces are covered by mineral particles. This is a very large scale process for separating different species of little grains. I was talking about that because when you talk to people about foam applications, they say beer or chocolate mousse, which are, of course, very nice options, but in fact, by far not the most relevant ones in terms of economy or ecology. So here is an economically relevant one. You have uh, minerals that come in nature as mixtures of things you want and that you don't want. Quartz is mixed up with hematite, which contains iron. Quartz is hydrophilic, it likes water, just drops to the ground if you put it in the big uh, pool with liquid and some surfactants. Whereas the hematite, being hydrophobic, sticks to the bubbles, gets carried up to the surface, and then you've got your foam. And you again want to understand and control aging to get rid of the bubbles and get the hematite. So it's not just humans who use firms to their advantage. Animals, animals do that a lot in 2D and 3D. Bees are an obvious example who build optimized structures where as little wax as necessary is used to build their uh, beehives. And uh, this is another example. It's an insect of the... Um, family of the Afrophoridae, now commonly known as the Spittleberg. And you see that little bird producing a bubble over here. It not just stops with one bubble, there's many bubbles. It builds an entire house of bubbles, which protects it against insects and has various other biological advantages. Now, what about the point of view of physics, packing, mathematics, and so on? Um, in that perspective, um, it's interesting to note that foams have structures on many different length scales. On the microscopic scale, but you see something white without obvious structures, which you would like to describe in terms of a continuum uh, for mechanics, drainage, uh, optics, and so on. You characterize that just by the chemical composition and the packing fraction. Looking more closely, we come to the scale where packing is relevant. You have these bubbles. And the nice thing about it is that all the energy is in the interfaces. So in equilibrium, we have minimal surfaces here. No roughness, no complicated uh, uh, bumps or wrinkles in equilibrium. 
And then we wonder about packing structures. And if I stick with the idea of mechanics here, would no longer be continuum. We have to wonder about force chains and uh, um, the way force is transmitted through the packings. But it's not enough uh, to understand firms because we've got these contacts, which are obviously very important, which are um, of nanometer thickness and where there's molecular processes coming into play, building up something we call this joining pressure. And in the end, we have uh, the interfaces covered by these molecules who themselves can have either viscous or elastic properties like skins. And um, many problems are such that in the end, you need to do a coupling between all these different time scales, which is of course nice, but complicated as well. And the problem of aging I will talk about in the following is one of these. Now, let me come back to the picture I had in the beginning. We see uh, some foam floating on liquid below, above you've got gas, and um, the foam on the bottom here is like a sphere packing, a polydisperse sphere packing. And as you go further and further up, by the buoyancy of all these spheres, um, which are lighter than the water, adds up and pushes out the liquid and produces polyhedral structures, bringing us to this uh, uh, packing of polyhedra, which is again, minimal surface, but under, uh, under constraint, under different constraints. All this can be rationalized, not only in terms of the packing fraction, but also in terms of the confinement pressure, which is in the present case set by gravity. Um, some words about mutation. Well, this is what I call a plateau border. It's a junction between um, three bubbles coming together. And this is a vertex. It's a tetrahedral junction of, of four plateau borders. And if you go up there in the dry limit, uh, you have uh, plateaus rules that I mentioned in my talk last week that tell us how uh, these different uh, orientations must come together. Um, now, um, let us uh, look at the transition between um, the wettest foams and the driest foams and even wetter structures where there is a lot more liquid than there is gas. Well, obviously we didn't see this in the previous picture because it was all in equilibrium, but you can have in metastable equilibrium, um, more or less homogeneous bubble assemblies and foams uh, with a whole range of liquid fraction. Now, um, and on the dry side, you've got this here, as we saw. Uh, on the extremely wet side, you'd have just a dilute dispersion of bubbles. And what happens in between? Well, it's the jamming transition, well known in granular physics, which happens at a uh, packing fraction or a liquid fraction, around 36%, maybe a, a bit less when it's poorly dispersed. When people have been wondering whether this is a phase transition. I think the debate is still not entirely settled. Uh, what you can see is some topological properties which are of importance. As you go from the liquid to the gem solid phase here, um, it's gone from zero to six. This is the necessary number of neighbors for uh, some rigid elastic behavior. This is Maxwell's constraint counting argument. And as you go further and further up, you get more and more contacts and you end up with something like 14 or it depends a bit on polydispersity. And of course, as I said, you can think of the same evolution here in terms of the confinement pressure, which is zero up to here, and then it goes up to higher and higher values. So, so the pressure that you define is emerging from buoyancy mostly or buoyancy of bubbles or the pressure that it is in this present case uh, coming from buoyancy of bubbles it's uh, um, the when I say confinement pressure I mean by this uh, the uh, pressure due to contact forces between individual grains the confinement towards it. So... yes and the confinement pressure but this is the term used um, in the permanent emulsion community we call this osmotic pressure which is a little bit confusing because it it's not the same as the osmotic pressure of entropic origin that you find in uh, solutions, for instance. So it's uh, a description, microscopic uh, description of the force network that's acting between the particles. And uh, 
This is the occasion to say a few words about the comparison between foams and granular materials, which have been subject of previous talk at this workshop. Or you can have uh, structures which look pretty similar. Uh, this is a sphere packing, granular sphere packing. This is a bubble packing, which is very wet. So do similar structures bring in similar physics? Well, there are some similarities and differences. In the case of grains, you can have lots of different shapes, um, which is not the case here because this is minimal surfaces. You can uh, freely choose what you want. Uh, here, the shapes are um, not necessarily extremely well defined. You always have issues with surface roughness, which is very important because it determines the amount of friction that you can have, for instance. So the, this uh, phenomenon of not perfectly known roughness and so on does not exist here. This is a simpler system, and this is why lots of simulation and granular physics have been done with uh, frictionless spheres. And uh, in these papers in general, if you read in the introduction, okay, this is not exactly what I have in a sand pile, but still it is uh, relevant, my simulation, which is simple, because it could be a model for foams and emulsions. So this is, raises the question, is a foam really a granular material without static friction? Not quite true. This is because the interactions uh, are not the same when you press two grains against each other. Imagine that you've got here two spherical grains and you push them against each other so that if they had conserved their spherical shape, they would have had to interpenetrate. Um, let's call this this characteristic distance, which you can also identify by measuring the distance between the center and this flattened contact facet by what I call a contact displacement. So the contact displacement is the difference between the initial sphere radius and the distance from the center to uh, the contact here. Uh, you can then um, write uh, the relation between contact displacement and the uh, force pushing the particles against each other. It's a famous calculation by Hertz from the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, I don't remember, which tells you that in granular materials and elastic spheres, the force goes as the overlap or the contact displacements to the power of three halves. It's not a harmonic interaction, it's not linear. If you do the same thing with bubbles, it's very different because um, the energy resides not in the bulk, only in the interfaces. You can't have any energy uh, of elastic nature inside the bubble because there you only have gas. It's a completely different calculation. And in the limit of small forces, of very weakly deformed particles here, you get the most written relation, which is this uh, contact displacement goes as force times logarithm of force. So you get very different asymptotics. Another interesting uh, distinction between granular materials and foams is the question of controlling a packing structure. It's so difficult in a sand pipe to produce a um, homogeneously dispersed, uh, poly dispersed structure. You easily get some kind of segregation. And, um, of course, you can put your whole thing into an x ray tomograph to see what you actually have, but uh, to prepare a sample in a well controlled, reproducible way is always something delicate. Whereas firms have this aging phenomena that I will come to in more detail shortly, and um, which produce a packing which you cannot choose, but is, which is always the same. So this seemingly completely disordered arbitrary structure it has a statistical packing properties which come out of the aging process and which bring you always the same thing. So if you want to prepare your sample properly, you just put it into some cup and you wait till it coarsens enough and it will be reproducible from one experiment to the other, which is of course a very nice thing if you want to do biology on it or optical properties or whatever. So why not? Uh, I just want to elaborate a little bit on why you're saying that the granular metastructure is hard to control. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I suppose I appreciate there are these limits uh, that are related to sample size, right? and of course, obviously, the problem related to gravity uh, that gives you heterogeneities. But mm -hmm. I suppose all this work on everything between random boost picking and random class picking shows that the structure is fairly uh, well defined. Yes, but if you have, for instance, uh, a poly dispersed uh, grain dispersion, and you pour it into some container or something under shear, you easily have segregation uh, phenomena. When you vibrate and tap, uh, you will not necessarily conserve uh, the same contrib uh, distribution. It is not easy, my granular experimental physics colleagues tell me, to prepare uh, a state which is um, uh, completely homogeneous and of uh, well-determined structure. If you do, for instance, a mechanics experiment, uh, you always have a lot of fluctuations due to the difficulty in preparing the initial state. So you may have procedures to reduce this, uh, this complexity, but still um, there is um, a, uh, an easier way to get a foreseeable uh, polyspersity and packing structure uh, in the case of bones, which you cannot choose on the other hand. And now we come to the aging of liquid bone. Um, so why does the structure evolve? We have three different things here. One we saw already on my very first slide, which is drainage. It's just the trickling down of the liquid uh, under the effect of gravity. Uh, you've got coalescence, it's just films popping because uh, they're getting so thin and uh, some density, some thickness fluctuation just degenerates and makes a hole. This you can uh, very strongly suppress by a good choice of surfactant. And here you've got coarsening, um, which is due to the fact that in each bubble you have a gas overpressure, which is given by the interfacial curvature, separating um, the gas and the liquid phase, this is Laplace law. The smaller the bubbles are, the more curvature there is, the more pressure there is. And this drives a diffusive gas current that will empty uh, the smaller bubbles into the bigger bubbles. And here you see a bit of video uh, showing you uh, how this thing um, progresses in time. Ah, here is a bubble shrinking and there are more and more of them shrinking. You see reorganization processes going on, which we call uh, E1 processes. And in the course of time, you get uh, from this initial structure, which was fairly monodispersed, towards something that looks uh, very disordered, which is very disordered and polydispersed, but it is polydispersed in a specific uh, way that. Um, you can study uh, in particular when you switch off the other processes here, because in nature or in applications, you generally have all three of them on top of each other. If um, there's drainage, this will uh, reduce the um, difficulty of diffusion. You have bigger and bigger contact films. You have thinner and thinner contact films in the end. And so you speed up coarsening if you have drainage. If you have a drainage, you also get many of these very thin films, which are more likely to rupture. And there is a complicated coupling between the other these. And if you want to compare a model to something that you've measured, or well, you've got this mixture, it's um, very difficult to tell apart. And anyway, it's very hard, and if not impossible, to stabilize extremely wet films. As I told you, they are transient, uh, because drainage will kill them anyway. And um, uh, coarsening takes time, so you cannot really study coarsening in a transient foam. There are other tricks you can just rotate your, your sample, call it a cleostat. And um, in principle, this changes the direction of gravity with respect to your sample. So you might think, oh, that's a very nice way of having this trickling in all directions, and so it effectively doesn't make my structure heterogeneous, but um, um, still there is a problem because if the foam is very wet, the drainage is very fast and you have to spin it very quickly, and then you produce centrifugal forces. 
which push you the uh, perm uh, radially outward and you have not managed to do what you want. Uh, there are other more complicated tricks using the fact that water is slightly diamagnetic. So some people stick foams into huge magnetic fields, which produces levitation. And so you can compensate gravity. Very nice, but you need something like 20 Tesla. So it's huge magnets, superconducting. Uh, 20 Tesla, uh, any measurement device uh, becomes very delicate. Uh, they are refrigerated below a liquid nitrogen temperature. So, so having a sample of homogeneous temperature in there is really hard. So no very successful experiment where all these artifacts have been ruled out uh, to date. And so what about microgravity? You could just take some foam, put it on the ISS, and uh, watch porcelain for days, as long as you want, actually, without any drainage ha happening. And this was an idea that uh, um, took 20 years to come to some results. Indeed, uh, the first proposal was written, I think, around 2000, maybe, yeah. And there was a group of scientists around this idea, many of whom have retired since, because it just took too much time. But uh, we have data and experiments running on the ISS right now. There is an experiment running uh, on the ISS uh, since two years. Our business the ISS, and uh, we are in uh, in one of these. Our experiment is in one of these it's tubes here. Looks like oh, a big. Well, it's about that size. And uh, you've got a laptop, but it's a laptop that controls the expand, but it's a laptop from the 90s. So technology hasn't been upgraded on the ISS. So we have to live in very, very old fashioned technology on, on this um, probe in space. And then there is something the size of a microwave oven where all our experiments is integrated. It's full of uh, lasers and electronics and so on. And you hear a carousel of sample cells, one of which is represented over here. The actual sample is like one cubic centimeter. And there you have a um, piston with a magnet and there are coils around that, which um, make it possible to agitate this piston, make foam in a reproducible way. And then you've got a window here and through the window, you see this kind of thing. So that bubbles in microgravity 2000 seconds after having been produced. Um, also, initially, you have more than a million bubbles, depending on conditions. You can even have like 10 million of bubbles. And this is system size that you need actually to have coarsening uh, run over sufficiently amounts of time and uh, bubble growth reaching sufficient sizes so that the um, the characteristics of this growth are fully developed that I will show you in a, in a second, in a minute. Um, besides this optical observation through the top window, we also have a laser shining on the side and uh, a detector looking at how much light comes out on the other side. Uh, and why this is useful, I will tell you in a few moments. So here is the phenomenon of coarsening, one example. I should give this initial picture at 2000 seconds and then a little bit later, 7000 seconds, well, the small bubbles have been emptied into the bigger bubbles. And if you wait still longer, well, the process goes on. Um, looks very disordered. You don't see any clear tendency here. So, what's special about this process is a statistical self similarity. And to explain what I mean by this, Let's take a uh, part of this picture here, zoom it, and put it below this other picture. And you choose your zoom factor such that the average size uh, of the bubbles here and the bubbles there are the same. And now um, you can try to do analysis of neighbor correlations and any kind of structural feature you can come up with. And uh, it turns out that after a sufficient amount of time, after an initial period of, uh, of growth, uh, 
you get that situation where uh, if you hide the information, which of these images is the later one and which is the earlier one, you will be totally unable to tell which is which. This is statistically gives itself similar growth. We also call this the scaling state. And this is illustrated here for uh, two different uh, liquid uh, fractions. This is a very wet foam uh, for uh, the earliest age we have a picture was uh, 200 seconds after the creation of the foam. It goes up to 300,000 seconds. So long-term experiment, several days. And the very first uh, size distribution here are uh, still a little bit different from what we have later on, but um, beyond something like uh, 5,000 seconds or maybe even 2,000 seconds, while you're sitting all the time on, on this curve here, of course, pictures are different, but here you scale the distribution by the average size and it all comes to a master plot. And the, the shape of this curve is very much dependent on the amount of liquid that you have in there. Uh, if you have very wet foams, uh, there's actually rather more the bubbly liquid. This kind of distribution here, and you get a very peaked distribution with lots of small bubbles if you have a somewhat drier foams. Um, all this is uh, explained in detail in, in this uh, article, which is right now in press, where we describe much of these results. Uh, have we trained the foam in microgravity? No, we have not trained it. Uh, we have these cells, and in each shell on the ground, we um, put a given amount of liquid and a, a given amount of gas. And uh, we check that the cell is extremely impermeable, so we conserve at the milligram level the amount of liquid, and um, it's only in, in space that we shake them, and this allows us uh, from cell to cell to scan through a, a range of different liquid fractions. This is the different you cells. More, you each cell more bubbles to have drier foam layers. Um, no. Every uh, liquid fraction is a different sample. We have uh, a large number of these red dots here corresponds to all the different cells, which are completely separate. And in each cell, you have so many milliliters of liquid and so many uh, milliliters of gas at the atmospheric pressure. And then you can agitate it to foam it uh, up to a initial bubble size, which is uh, like 50 microns or something like that. Can do this several times and then you wait for the process to go on and um, to help the size increase in time. So this is the way the experiment is carried out and this is now uh, the time increase of the average bubble radius um, as a function of age and for various uh, liquid fractions here and I will tell you later where these uh, expressions come from, but for the first time, for the time being, I just show the experimental evidence. You see something like two families of uh, curves. Um, each color is a different liquid fraction. So initially it's a bit rounded here, and then you have in this log log plot a convergence to something that looks like a power law, and the final slope here is a uh, very much consistent over a range of liquid fraction, which is the driest one that we investigated, 15, up to something like uh, 37, 38%. And then there is a jump across over to something different, where we still have this rounded offset, and then a slope of one third. Um, then you have these full lines here, which are fits, which actually only have uh, a single parameter, which is uh, this one here. Um, this is what we call a parabolic, parabolic growth law. And this is a cubic growth law. It describes asymptotically a power law. Asymptotically, you don't want, you, you don't uh, consider these constants here. You only have R goes as the square root of time. And here R goes as the cubic root of time. And initially, you still have an importance of the initial term here. This is why all, all these curves are rounded. Okay. So you fit both of those laws at each set of data and fit the. Yeah. 
So you could uh, take this law and fit it to the other kind of data. It just looks very bad. I didn't show it here, but it is really uh, doesn't give any. You don't need to do statistical tests to see that it's completely off. Um, before commenting on where these laws could come from, what kind of model we can think of, let me comment a few experimental aspects. Because, uh, well, this here was uh, initially observation, observations at the surface of this little cubic sample. And you can ask the question, maybe there is something special about the surface. Maybe the bubbles in the bulk would age in a way different from those at the surface and we wouldn't know about it. Can we comment this? And then there's another issue when you watch bubbles on the surface. You can see uh, sizes, but this is a projection. This is um, possibly um, biased by uh, special packing features near a surface. Is there a, uh, a non-trivial bias between the bubble size distribution that we see at the surface and the one that we have in the bulk? And one could think of answering that kind of question by simulations, for instance. I think this is a very modern tendency, but we did this experimentally. Um, so the experimental, yes? You comment how, roughly how many bubbles you have at the beginning and yeah. Yes, in the beginning we have a few million bubbles. And in, the, um, in principle, if we waited long enough, we'd end up with a single bubble. But this is no longer a structure which we think is in the range of the kind of model we are considering. So uh, the latest points that I showed you here uh, are the case where you have uh, the biggest of all bubbles, one fifth, fifth of the sample uh, thickness. So the very latest points are less, uh, less good than what we have before. I could have drawn this line a bit further. It would have been roughly on the same characteristic, but we just stopped it because we thought, well, finite size effects are very powerful. So we don't want to go into that regime. So you reduce it by two orders of magnitude, please. Yeah. So in the end, we have, uh, in terms of bubble size, an order of magnitude. And we could have maybe more, I don't know, but uh, um, yeah. we don't consider this. So what about this bulk versus surface question? Uh, I'll make a quick digression into optical properties of polydispersed random bubble packings, which we're hearing about plasmonics and so on in packings. So this is on a different length scale. Here we talk about uh, objects which are a lot bigger than the optical wavelength um, near the jamming transition, which is the range we are particularly interested in. The foams look roughly like this. So we use molecular dynamics simulations to generate packings of the same polydispersity as we have in, in the foam, the boundary conditions. And then we use ray tracing, the well-known law of geometrical optics, to follow rays of light going through this medium. Now, uh, this gives us trajectories that look like this here, and you can uh, discuss distance from the starting point to the end point of, uh, of such a trajectory. This is just basic random walk uh, problem. And of course, you've got the fusion law uh, telling us the square of the displacement goes as six times the diffusion constant as uh, at times the time. And uh, then again, the basics of uh, diffusion uh, tell us how we can relate the diffusion, diffusion coefficient to the, um, to the step length on the diffusion path. Um, the velocity of propagation here is a factor one third. And then we just have to take uh, many simulated trajectories for a given um, sample for the dispersity and work via the simulations uh, to uh, get the diffusion coefficient and to extract the relation but uh, giving us the uh, the uh, 
the length, the characteristic length that comes into this problem. And since we know in the beginning the exact polydispersity and sample size that we put in, we can work out the relation between the average bubble size and uh, the diffusion coefficient that we have in such a material. And having established this during simulations, which we independently checked with uh, experiments, we can now come back to our uh, ISS experiment. We will have our foam sample. We shine on it with a laser. On the other side, we have a detector. And then we solve the diffusion equation for this unpleasant geometry with optical boundary conditions on the side. Why? Well, this is not, nothing very uh, sophisticated about this. It's complicated, but there's, there's no uh, delicate physics in here. And we can extract from the intensity received by the detector the average size of the bubbles. So this is uh, a technique which uh, exists for many years now. It's called diffuse transmission spectroscopy, used a lot in uh, various uh, soft matter applications. We just um, it adapted it uh, to our special situation and we did these simulations to get really good information about what we have in the case of polydisperse uh, uh, distributions. And here is the conclusion. Um, here we compare for the, all the range of liquid fractions, the uh, bubble growth that we extract from observations at the surface, uh, which is the colored disks here and the growth that we extract from the light transmission, which is not sensitive to the surface, but sensitive to the bulk. And this is the crosses. Um, well, there's maybe little fluctuations here and there, but globally it's an excellent agreement between the two. So we can experimentally uh, rule out any anomaly of coarsening uh, that would be related to the proximity to the surface. And that's the second question. Do we have some kind of bias if we look at the surface of the poem sample and we count all the bubbles of different sizes, we draw a distribution? Is, is there a difference between that distribution and the one that we would have if we were able to sample in the bulk? Of course, on Earth, we would be tempted to stick the thing into an x ray tomograph and just get all the bubble sizes, um, but we don't have an x ray tomograph on the ISS. Um, so what we do? So we did an experiment, which is not a perfect proof, but a strong indication. We produced foam, which has polydispersity roughly similar to what we have in space. And from the same production, we derived one part, which we put into a box with a window, very much like the one, the cell we have in the ISS. And this is a typical image of that kind. And here we do our uh, image processing to extract the size of the uh, bubbles that we see. And then uh, we extract from the same production here, some of the foam and we um, put it into a box, which is filled with foaming liquid. And there's so little foam that it just forms a, a monolayer of bubbles. So in this case, we will see each and every bubble that uh, came out of this initial distribution separate from uh, the other bubbles. There's no bubble hidden behind or something like that. And this is the op opportunity to get the true size distribution that was in the initially produced foam. And we compare the two. And it turns out that, um, well, possibly there are artifacts, but they're beyond our resolution. We did this uh, with 15% uh, liquid fraction in this foam here, 30% liquid fraction in um, the open and the closed circle are respectively um, the diluted case and the compressed case, and there's really not much of a difference. So that was the experimental check that um, uh, such biases, if they exist, must be pretty small. Um, so then to, to be able to model, to get all the basic information about our system, there's another question we have to think about. It is uh, how thick are the liquid films separating bubbles? Because this thickness will be an important parameter in the model uh, for, for the diffusion gas transfer, um, of course. So uh, what can we say about this thickness? Well, 
here is a close-up view of uh, foam at that length scale. We've got these the liquid in blue. Here is a little bit of film, and here it matches to a meniscus and going into the toe border. This is a very, very small length scale, but if the film is uh, of a thickness which is of the order of magnitude of a few nanometers, and uh, of course here you've got curved interfaces, the radius of curvature is uh, symbolically shown by the circle here, and as soon as you've got a curved interface, you've got Laplace pressure. So you have a pressure difference between here and there, which depends on the surface tension controlled by the coverage with the molecules, and you have got this Laplace pressure difference. Now, inside the film, you don't have pressure. There is no Laplace pressure. So there must be another pressure uh, which balances it, because all through the liquid, you must have constant pressure and equilibrium. What is this other pressure, which is resisting the suction that we've got here? This is uh, the electrostatic interaction between the heads of the surfactant molecules. We use charged uh, surfactants, so this is uh, um, anionic, so it's, it's a negatively charged head. And there's a Coulomb uh, repulsion here, and we call the, uh, the repulsion disjoining pressure. This effect is summarized in the disjoining pressure, and an equilibrium foam uh, has uh, a disjoining pressure equal to the capillary pressure related to interfacial curvature uh, in the network of plateau borders. Now, um, how can we tell about the capillary pressure in such a random foam? Nothing there to, to measure it in the ISS for sure. Um, uh, there are relations between capillary pressure and uh, the confinement pressure. So unfortunately, I, I think it's not reasonable. I don't have time to talk about all of these things. Time is running very fast. Um, um, if anybody's interested, uh, you can have a look at this paper where we worked out the relation between osmotic and capillary pressure. And um, uh, the osmotic pressure in turn also has models uh, which related to liquid fraction. So we're able to say how the capillary pressure here normalized by surface tension divided by gubble radius varies with liquid fraction. And uh, we, we can uh, predict with pretty much confidence the range of capillary pressure that we have in view of the bubble sizes and in view of the liquid fraction. And then there are ind independent experiments which have been performed on ground, uh, where there were optical measurements, interference phenomena measurements, uh, with light beams uh, looking at the reflectivity of the film, which tell us what the film thickness is. And we see here the relation that is uh, significant for our problem, there is a huge variation of capillary uh, of uh, uh, capillary pressure with film thickness. So these interaction forces drop off in a very radical way. Um, therefore, the steepness of this curve, which is logarithmic here, uh, makes that, in fact, over the range of liquid fractions and bubble size that we have, we end up with a fairly limited uh, range of film thicknesses which is around 30 nanometers. Important to know. Now we have all this together and we come to uh, models uh, that aim to explain what we see. Um, how can we explain foam coarsening? Um, well, there are various, very simple approaches that you can think of. But here is a nice picture that I took from Simon's work. It illustrates uh, a, uh, a wet foam, you've got all these bubbles with their contacts, and you can do a very, very simple first step by saying, well, the change in time, the time derivative of the volume of a 3D bubble um, is basically driven by uh, the difference in the plus pressures, which goes as one of the radius, one over the radius of the two bubbles involved, so this tension is somewhere in the factor. And then another very important factor is the contact area between neighboring bubbles, which I call here Fij. And um, lots of pre-factors here, like uh, for instance, one over the thickness of the film you have to go through, and uh, the Henry constant, which is about the solubility of the gas, the diffusion constant of the gas and the liquid. Maybe I will not go into all of these uh, details. 
Um, so if you just do the derivative, you get rid of the R square, which comes from the fact that you have here the, the surface of the Fij is the fraction of the surface, uh, which is covered by contacts and R squared times Fij is the actual surface. The R square uh, goes away with the R square when you get, you get when you do the derivative here and you come up, up with this kind of equation if you average over the whole foam, all the constants are condensed into this omega zero. You see the kind of uh, equation that you have. Now, um, if you are in a scaling state with uh, self-similar growth, then what can you do? You can multiply the whole thing by the average radius. And uh, then you will have in this right-hand side of the equation only ratios between bubble sizes, dimensionless ratios. And in a statistically self-similar situation, all ratios of characteristic sizes are invariant. So whole, the whole thing on the right-hand side becomes a constant and the R times time derivative of R can be written as the time derivative of R square. R, so this derivative is constant. And you see that you end up with exactly the kind of law that I presented as a fitting law. Um, R square is a constant plus another constant times uh, the, uh, the foam age. And of course we get uh, in the limit of long times the square root of, of time um, behavior. Well, this is something you can do in the case of wet foams. Um, in the case of dry foams, there is the von Neumann argument, which is presumably very well known. It's all about topology. Maybe I don't recall the von Neumann argument, but it's a topology-based uh, argument that gives you exactly the same growth law. And one question is, how do you switch from one to the other? Here, apparently, topology is really the major argument here, geometry is the major argument. They both go into the same growth law, but how does the system switch over from one to the other? So that was the side of, um, of foam coarsening. Then you can think about uh, what happens beyond the unjamming transition when the bubbles no longer touch. And you have them swimming independently here. And uh, in this bulk liquid, there will be some kind of average gas concentration, which is set by the average Laplace pressure inside these different bubbles. Those who are smaller than average will give their gas to the bath. Uh, those who are larger than average have a smaller pressure and thus receive their gas from the bath. And this has been the object of the mean field models going a huge families of mean fields models initiated by the work by Lifshitz, Sliosov, and Wagner. I will not go into these details. You can find there's a very nice review on this in here. And it ends up with an equation which has a similar form to what we found previously, only that you don't have R squared, you have R cubed. And this gives the T to the third, one third growth law. So we expected before doing this experiment, a scenario which is roughly like this. Here you've got liquid fraction. This is uh, very wet foams, very dry foams, jamming transition. On the one side, we were expecting this uh, power law one third. On the dry side, we were expecting one half. And um, well, there are some detailed questions about the, the size distribution, but this is what we wanted. And it looks pretty much at first sight like what we had because we've got the one half, we've got the one third, we've got the different size distributions, and we were almost happy until we thought a little bit more about um, the packing fraction at which we saw the transition. Because this happened between 37 and a half and 40% with an error bar like 1%. So each of these experiments was done between three and five times. So it's not one single experiment, which could be strange. Um, so we're pretty sure about this range of the crossover between the two kinds of behaviors. And that's really odd because the random close packing fraction of more dispersed spheres is 36% uh, liquid fraction. And the more polydispersed it gets, uh, the smaller this number will be. So actually we're wondering what is in the case of the such a very strong polydispersity, the random close packing fraction where you'd expect the loss of contacts and the crossover between these two kinds of mechanisms. And we put this kind of polydispersed uh, packing into LAMS, our favorite uh, molecular dynamics code. 
Willem tried to represent the interactions between the bubbles in a very um, realistic way because here we're talking about the case where the bubbles stop touching. So that there's no issue with the interaction law that it's just zero the interaction force in this hypothesis. And so we, we did the standard thing to get the random close packing fraction. We uh, compacted from dilute dispersions and we came up with something like a 32%. It's extremely poorly dispersed. So we've got something much lower than 36%. So there's a really big gap between these two packing fractions. And what can that be? Now, the answer came actually from one experiment with an extremely dilute uh, packing fraction, which attracted our attention because it looked like this. We saw clusters of bubbles sticking together. And um, uh, this was, this suggests some, some adhesive forces, so the random um, dispersions should not look like this. There should not be any strings like this. We have a few more pictures which all show the strings. It was unexpected to have any kind of adhesion for that kind of surfactant. Nowhere in the literature there was an indication about it. So we reproduced something similar on Earth by putting bubbles under a glass plate and by watching the structures that we get, well, we again got these chains. Then we use microfluidics and uh, we had two really equal size bubbles sitting next to each other. We used uh, a lot of imaging, image processing techniques to get very accurate measurements of the contact angle here. And we came up with something like three or four degrees, which is very small, but went unnoticed, probably relevant mostly under conditions that you access most easily in microgravity. But still, uh, it introduced this, this adhesion, and that really changes very much the picture. Because uh, when you go beyond the random close packing fraction, um, you will not directly go to a dilute dispersion, but you have structures like this, adhesive networks. And um, what our data in terms of growth exponents now suggests is a scenario which is different from the expected one. We have um, the conventional growth up to 32%. Then um, the dilute dispersion beyond something like uh, 38 or 40%. And in between an adhesive network where the packing fraction is such that we don't have a close packing, but we still have gas transfer mostly through the links between the bubbles. Now, this is odd because um, there is no reason that there should be, there's no known reason that there should be a uh, unjamming transition in adhesive systems at such a specific uh, packing fraction. Unjamming transitions in adhesive systems which are in terminal equilibrium have been um, studied pretty much in recent literature by Tom Mason, for instance. In that case, you do have terminal equilibrium which comes into play. This is an athermal system. And uh, in principle, if we think of arbitrary network structures, you could have <coughs> connected networks down to uh, the up to arbitrary liquid fractions. So how could this possibly all fit together? Well, here is the conjecture we are currently thinking about. This is ongoing work. Um, well, we, we, we think that the coarsening process drives a percolation transition depending on liquid fraction. Um, to explain this, let's look at this cartoon here. We have uh, here a uh, loosely connected bubble network close to the conventional jamming transition, which would undergo coarsening, but still you'd have uh, contacts um, between the bubbles all the way along the coarsening process, and that directly gives you the exponent one half. And then well, we, we postulate that there is something like a percolation transition where um, this network breaks up into disconnected islands. You might say, uh, but in these islands, you still have lots of contacts, so this doesn't change so much. Well, it does change so much because in any of these clusters here, the biggest of the bubbles will eat up the smaller ones and any cluster, any island will become a single bubble. 
which will then be disconnected from all the other bubbles and we end up by the nature of this coarsening process with a uh, dispersion of uh, independent bubbles where we switch to the other gas transfer process with an exponent one third. I've been talking to a lot, a lot of theorists working on non-equilibrium phase transitions and percolation, whether they could think of uh, some uh, something that brings that drives this percolation transition, which is obviously it should be related to uh, the coarsening dynamics, but uh, this didn't ring any bells. So we're in the process of doing um, um, uh, simulations, starting simulations. Uh, and the aim to to simulate this actually, and to see this happen and to understand how it happens. Just uh, one more word before I come to my conclusion um, about the competition between gas transfer through the bulk and gas gas transfer through the contact film in the case of adhesive interactions. Um, of course, if you've got these loosely connected structures. There are these contact films, they are pretty small in view of the small value of the contact angle, but you might also think of the possibility of gas diffusion just going through liquid. And to get a rough feeling for how these two um, mechanisms compete, well, we used, we, we calculate on the one hand for two bubbles of similar size, not identical size, but similar size, the mass flow, the gas flow uh, through the contact film as a function of the thickness and difference of pressure here. And then we wondered what would be the gas flow if I just separate these two bubbles, I make the tiny contact film vanish and I end up with two neighboring spheres. That's the Laplace problem for two neighboring spheres. That's been done by uh, Schilling and Durian, and they came up with an expression for this kind of diffusing gas transfer in nearby but not touching spheres. And we expect that the nearby not touching spheres would have a gas flow in the meniscus far away from the contact here. That would be similar to the gas flow that we have here. So this comparison is telling us about which out of these mechanisms is actually more efficient for getting gas from the smaller to the slightly larger bubble. And here I've got a diagram where these two respective gas flows are compared. Um, the red ones are the gas flows due to this mechanism. The black one is that mechanism. And we've got this for different contact angle. The one the most relevant for us would be close to this one here. And it turns out that due to the geometry of this problem and of the diffusion equation, you have a advantage for uh, the gas transfer to the film, which case more and more important as you get to larger and larger bubbles compared to the film thickness. And uh, our films are all on this branch of the curve. So uh, this estimate um, suggests that indeed, in this loosely connected network of bubbles we've been talking about, we indeed not have uh, so much gas transfer through the bulk, but mostly still to these contact firms that are large enough to do that. Okay, so I guess this brings me to almost to the end, just one final slide to point out uh, some further questions, which I don't have to discuss. Um, but we've, we've been seeing that uh, there were very different size distributions that were naturally produced by the coarsening process depending on the liquid fraction, the more liquid I have, the more symmetric it gets. If I have a, a, a little less liquid, there was this sharp peak that you saw on the size distribution. And um, the question we would like to understand better is, is this um, tuning of the size distribution that happens essentially by a kind of self-organization process of, of this disorder packing, it can be it can be tuned this uh, this distribution by changing uh, the gas, the solubility of the gas, surface tension, interfacial properties. Is there some way to control this process process to steer uh, the self-assembled structure to something that would be useful? So, what could be useful? Um, what could be useful is this coexistence of very small and very large bubbles that we saw and which was documented by the peak on the size distribution. Here we've got a little yellow dot uh, drawn on each small bubble, which is 
sitting in the networks of the interstices of the larger bubbles here, you have a zoom. So why is it nice to have small bubbles sitting in these interstices? Well, this uh, is related to work by Rodney Lakes many years ago, who pointed out that hierarchical structures with different length scales typically have a much better strength to density ratio. And this is uh, potentially useful when you think of these liquid foams as precursors for lightweight solid weight, solid weight materials. So what do we do next? Well, we want now to build models to understand the physics and then be able to tune the process. That brings us into many different questions about packing, about minimal surfaces, about uh, diffusion, about mean field models that work or don't work. And uh, a very important point here is simulations. Simon has been doing uh, quite a bit of simulations in 2D, and we're trying to connect all this together to understand how firms um, go to this scaling state. I guess I'll stop here. Ah, that's a very important slide. It's uh, the one where I thank my the many people who contribute to this work. So this is our uh, the clean room where we screwed together this uh, uh, microwave size uh, box with all the electronics in it that went on the ISS. And I hope I didn't forget too many people. It's the list of people working working on this project. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, he was expecting something up in the world. <laughs> yeah, well, that was an incredible talk. Thank you very much. And, uh, and so you said that at the dry farm limit and the wet farm limit is to the same ground law in 3D. In 3D, yes. Uh, so, uh, but of course, just so the same with the prefector, or uh, is that just the uh, it's only the one? It's only the experiment, and there is no very good theory for the prefector. To be honest, there's a lot of papers about this, and um, it's a really hard physics problem with lots of approximations to be made where you. Don't want too much complexity, but you still want accuracy. There are many, many trade offs, and um, this is really what we're fighting here to get the, the prefecture right. Yeah. Uh, do you see any, uh, do you see any integration of the difference to the that? Integration? I mean, sorry, you're, like you're, you're three and a half, e to the power of one and a half curves. Hmm? Uh, I mean, you hit them for both the drier limit bounds and the wetter limit bounds. Yes. Uh, is there anything to be learned from the prefectors of those? Countries? Oh, yes, of course. So um, uh, I said it is difficult. This is not to say that we don't have anything. Um, for instance, for uh, this thing here, oh, where are we do? So uh, there is the, uh, the thickness of uh, the, the, the area of a contact film. How do we tackle this problem, for instance? Well, here the strategy would be, um, we first uh, need to know about confinement pressure. Confinement pressure um, as a function of liquid fraction. So here we, especially near the dry limit, you can build an, a simple model, which is Pretty good, uh, well defined theory behind it. Yes, I don't have the time to make and tell you in, in private if, you, if you're interested, but we have a good model for osmotic pressure, uh, especially near uh, the, the drier firms. And then um, the uh, confinement pressure is closely related to the forces acting on a given bubble locally. This confinement pressure is something like the forces compressing any macroscopic bit of foam. But then you can focus into this macroscopic bit of foam, look at the single bubble, and even at the single bubble level, you still have forces pushing on it. And the, the, the sum of these forces regularly pushing inwards, divided by the bubble area, is again. The confinement pressure it will be fluctuating because it's a local quantity, but still, um, this local confinement pressure is governed by the macroscopic confinement pressure. And then, um, 
we can um, do the relationship between the average force and the size of a contact here. Uh, the, the bigger uh, the uh, force is that is squeezing neighboring bubbles on this bubble here, um, the bigger the contact area will be. And this requires a, a physical model of, uh, of, uh, of contacts. And we do have this, um, which in the paper I can show you. So we, we do have a physical model for this F of phi thing. Um, what we don't have is the impact of adhesion on this. This came out a bit later in our project. So we have not yet integrated the impact of adhesion on facet size, which becomes especially relevant in the wet limit. But we do have this. Uh, the more difficult one is uh, that one. And this is very closely con uh, connected to the packing in post neighbor shells. So you've got a bubble here, and you think about all the neighbors. And of course, what we have here is depending on the packing statistics around bubbles depending on size. So that's been this uh, work by Justin Brusik and Corwin and co workers who did the granocentric model. The granocentric model basically claims that uh, the size distribution of bubbles around the central bubble is weakly dependent on the size of the central bubble, which looks a bit odd to me. Um, but still, we took this as a uh, first approach. And um, if, if you can make this claim, you can directly deduce from the uh, global size distribution of your bubble um, the forces pushing on any given bubble. And from the force deformation rate, you do get this. And uh, the same information goes into that factor. So we, uh, in the paper that I, that is in press in top meta, uh, we have uh, fits of, of the prefactor, which are good, um, but they don't work very well near the jamming transition because we are not yet able to uh, inject uh, the impact of adhesion. But I, in one hour, I didn't go that far. Um, if I would interpret this a bit differently from a modeling perspective uh, and, and consider this as a, a two phase uh, problem of the air and, and the, the liquid, um, then if one incorporates hydrodynamics in, in, this, uh, in this problem, mm -hmm. then uh, it's also known that this scaling exponent changes and uh, one, one gets like uh, one half or even, even higher. Um, Due to the hydrodynamic effect. And this is mostly found if uh, like we have an equal fraction of the two phases and it's less prevalent or goes again to this one zero if, uh, if it uh, goes, goes off from this distribution. What do you call hydrodynamics here? Because it's basically quasi static, this thing is very slow. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so you say that there is no no flow or, or anything. Well, there is flow because we have um, dumps between different packing configurations. Sometimes when the small ones shrink and the big ones grow, packing just gets unstable and it quickly switches over into a new packing configuration. And the time scale uh, necessary for this to happen is a problem of hydrodynamics, but. Um, most of the time, a given packing will evolve only very, very slowly because uh, the radii shrink, shrink extremely slowly. And the viscous drag is uh, probably uh, a minor influence, except maybe if you go to extremely small bubbles, because in the very end, uh, there's a singularity of pressure as the rate of shrinks to zero. And there things happen very quickly and there hydrodynamics might matter. But this is on the other hand for bubbles among the population which are orders of magnitude smaller than the other. So it's a very local um, abrupt uh, event happening in there, which is not a big perturbation for the entire pack. Okay, so that's fine.